As a YouTube creator or a filmmaker, you've probably come across this term audio compression, wondered what it was, when you use it, or how you use it. So we're going to get into that in this episode. To understand audio compression, you have to first understand the term dynamic range. So in an audio system, a recording system, a recording media of any kind, whether that's a mirrorless camera, whether it's a smartphone or your computer, there are limits to the smallest signal that you can record and the limits to the largest signal you can record. So let's start with the, the bottom end first, and that is the noise floor. And that's the inherent noise that's, that's in the uh, media that you're recording on. And so obviously you don't want a signal, your smallest signal, to be down in that noise level. You want it to be a few dB or decibels higher than that. At the other end of the scale, if you're, you suddenly have a very loud signal, it may hit the top end of the capability of, of the, the media to record loud signals and you'll end up with distortion. So the dynamic range is defined as the difference between the loudest signal you can create or record without creating clipping or distortion and the smallest signal that you can record without having it buried in the noise. To demonstrate how compression works, I've used a function generator app on a tablet to create a, a, a bi-level signal. That is, there's a low level uh, audio signal and then it bursts up to a much higher level. The reason I'm doing that is that in the real world when you're doing a production you might find that uh, let's say you've got an interview uh, set up with uh, somebody who is very jovial and tends to clap or you know laugh a lot or whatever. There is a danger that uh, on high peaks on these these loud noises or if you've got a mix with, let's say, music with some heavy bass notes or a kick drum, uh, there is a possibility that even though everything else in your mix sounds right and is at about the right level, that uh, those transients, as they're called, could end up uh, forcing your uh, audio to go into clipping or into uh, a distortion. So what I've done, as I say, I, I've got a function generator set up to simulate that in a sense. I've got a low level signal and a high level signal. And if you look uh, at this illustration right now, this is actually a, sc a screen grab from, uh, from a, an audio editor showing that signal. And you can see that it's, it's, um, it's got a fair amount of headroom as it's called. Uh, that is room above the, the highest uh, level part of the signal and the top end of the dynamic range. You notice the dynamic range uh, goes both ways, positive and negative swings, because audio is, is, uh, is, an, is AC, really. It's alternating current uh, signals. So uh, that center line, the, the dark line in the center, is actually where the noise floor would be. So if there's no signal, you just see that black line. So again, this is, uh, this is uh, taken over time, so uh, I'm going to just play that clip for you now. And what you'll hear are a bunch of little chirps. And those chirps, those high-level chirps, are the signal when it bursts up and then comes back down again to a, a normal level. So if you, you look at that signal, it was again, there was a low-level portion to the signal, low uh, volume, if you like. If that's too low, your tendency would be in the final mix to, to pump that, uh, that audio track up. So what happens uh, when you do that and you're not paying attention to the, the loudest sounds on the track, you'll see in the next screen grab, there's a situation where, yes, the, uh, the low level signal now has been uh, increased in level so it's uh, a lot more audible, but now you've pushed the the high level signal into clipping. So this is a case where compression comes in. Compression will now react to any signal that goes over a certain threshold level as it's called and actually reduce the gain of the recording medium 
to prevent that signal from going into that clipping state. The next screenshot shows you what happens when I put that same signal through a compression system. And in this case, I used an external uh, hardware type of compressor. But there's actually a compressor built into your video editing system. It may be uh, DaVinci Resolve, which is what I use, and I'll give you a demonstration of how that looks in a little bit. Or it may be you're using Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro. They all have compressors in them. So you notice on this, uh, on this screen grab of the compressed signal, there, is a, a, there are two parameters. One's called attack and one's called release. So now this is assuming the signal has exceeded this threshold that we've set for the compression to, to kick in. And you'll see that once, you, um, once it goes into that mode, the attack actually is reducing the gain of that recording medium. And you can see that by the, the little initial spike when the compression reacts and then the signal comes down to attack time is typically defined as 63% when it comes to within 63% of its uh, final settled value that you see in the rest of that high level burst. But then once that high level burst goes away or high level signal goes away, um, the gain has to recover then to play those quieter parts of, of your mix. And the time that it takes to do that is called the release time. Now, there is no magic bullet in terms of what attack and release should be set to, but attack is typically in, in milliseconds. I use a, about 10 milliseconds as an attack time. If you make it too short, you might get a very sharp spike and it might sound like a click every time it kicks in. So you might want to slow it down a little bit. Release time is typically in hundreds of milliseconds or even seconds long. Now the problem is that if you make the release time too long, the recovery of the gain in the compressor may be very noticeable, especially if you've got, say, music with a lot of uh, thumping bass or drum that's, constant, that's uh, doing it at a rhythmic uh, pace, and you'll hear the background noise swishing up and down. I call it pumping and that can be a very undesirable effect. So you might want to back off on the release time, you know, get it down to say typically half a second to one second, something like that. And if you set the threshold too low, the compressor is always going to be kicking in and you will get more of that sort of pumping effect. So what settings you use, that's totally up to you and it depends on, on the mix that you're, you're trying to uh, compose. This is a hardware implementation of, of compression. Uh, now you have, in post-production obviously, you have uh, your video editor which has compression, but in order to prevent signals uh, from overloading in the field or in your studio, you might consider using one of these um, on the output of a mixer or whatever. So you have the same controls here that you would have in the software implementation. There's a threshold control which sets the level at which uh, the compression starts to kick in. You have a ratio control, which uh, is the compression ratio, so that's the amount of gain reduction that it uh, will impose on the signal when, it, uh, when the signal exceeds the threshold level. Uh, and attack and release, in this case I've got my attack set to about 10 milliseconds, release set to about 2 seconds, but again, you might want to sweeten that to your particular uh, requirement. So, uh, and you also have a makeup gain control here, which is uh, basically a gain control, controls the amount of output from the compressor after, um, after you've done the compression. And uh, then on the top, you see what the, uh, it's a switchable input or output level here to show you what happens to the final signal or what, what you're putting into the compressor. And then here, these LEDs show the amount of gain reduction that's occurring uh, as the signal exceeds the threshold. Now keep in mind that when you are doing a shoot, you may not always have the time to, to monitor audio levels if you don't have... you're doing a one-man shoot and uh, you're just concentrating on, uh, on the video. Uh, the problem is that if your audio ever 
goes into distortion because it's, the levels are too high. There's no recovering it later. So there are some alternatives. You could use a field mixer uh, with limiters built in or compress compression functions built in, perhaps. Or maybe you'll find those same sorts of, of uh, compression or limiting functions on, on sound recorder. So it's a good idea to give yourself some protection or use a safety channel on uh, on your microphone system, your wireless mic system. Sometimes they do have a safety channel which records at a much lower level than your main channel. So those are things to keep in mind. You can't recover badly distorted audio in post-production. As mentioned earlier, you can do compression in post-production. In this case, I'm using uh, DaVinci Resolve, and I've gone into the Fairlight module, which is the audio module, and here's my, my timeline with my audio tracks. So if I pick my audio track that I want to put compression on, and I can put it on any track I like, but let's just take uh, A1, which is my narration. Uh, if I right click or right double click in the dynamics section, uh, this board comes up and I can choose which uh, uh, function I want, whether it's expander, compressor or limiter, and I'm just going to concentrate on compressor for now because that's what we're talking about in this video. So if I just move this down a second and start to play, I won't hear the audio, but what you see here is uh, a plot of input volume in decibels, so it's a logarithmic scale, versus output. And what you see here is what's commonly called the knee in the response. So you notice as I as I adjust the threshold that level comes down at which the knee occurs. So in other words, uh, in this case, uh, if my sound level is at minus 35 dB, it will start to trigger the compression. If I move the threshold up, let's say to this point, it has to be as high as minus 20 uh, in order to to hit the compression. Uh, to start the compression, I should say. But over here, you'll notice something called gain reduction, and that is, um, you'll see the, the light flickering there, and what's happening is that's when the signal is actually exceeding this threshold, and it's starting to do this compression. And the compression is basically departing from this, this line that says whatever comes in goes out at the same level. Here, it's actually starting to reduce the gain and that is set by this control down here, which is called ratio. You notice the shape or, or the flatness of that, that curve changes depending on uh, how I set the ratio. And typically, I set it to around 5 to 1, something like that. Uh, and down here, of course, you have attack and release controls. And this is set for 1.4 milliseconds of attack, which is pretty quick. And release is pretty slow. It's only at, uh, or pretty, I should say, it's only at 93 milliseconds. So let's, um, let's once again adjust this threshold control. And you can see what's happening as I reduce the threshold. Suddenly the gain reduction is much more active because I've moved the knee of the um, threshold point down so that even for smaller signals, which are these high negative numbers, uh, it starts to kick in the compression. So you can get really ridiculous and come way down here. And this is the obviously compression's working all the time, which is not a desirable thing. You want it to just protect your uh, levels from, from going into clipping. So there we go. That's what it looks like in uh, DaVinci Resolve. And again, how you get to it in your uh, editing software, whether it's Premiere or Final Cut Pro, is going to vary, but the functionality is the same. So as always, uh, I hope you got something out of this, this video. I hope uh, I've cleared up the whole idea of compression and how it works. And by the way, uh, the difference between a, a compressor and a limiter, you've probably heard the term limiter before. Uh, typically, the compression ratio on a compressor, you limit it to f about five to one or less. That way it's less uh, noticeable. 
whereas a limiter is designed to uh, hard limit the signal so that it absolutely never goes up to the, the, the level where it will start to clip the or distort the audio. So a limiter is like a compressor, except you set it to a very high ratio, something like 10 to 1, which is a, a very shallow curve instead of a nice gentle curve. So I hope that's, uh, that's of use to you, and if you found it uh, interesting, useful, educational, whatever, please give it a thumbs up, that helps, and uh, if you're interested uh, in the kind of stuff I'm presenting, please subscribe to the channel, and if you want to be notified of additional videos that I'm uh, putting together, uh, hit that notification bell. Thanks a lot.